Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the Holocaust Center for Humanities Lunch and Learn program. I'm Alana Cohn Kennedy, the Holocaust Center's Director of Education. A live transcript for this program is available on Zoom for anyone who would like to use it. Click live transcript at the bottom of the screen and then click show subtitles. I wanna give a huge thank you to Verizon for sponsoring this series entitled Embracing Our Humanity and Diversity. Today's program is the third of four. We are grateful for Verizon support and we welcome all of the Verizon employees who are joining us today. Thank you to our community partners, Densho, the Bainbridge Island Japanese American Exclusion Memorial, the Seattle Art Museum, the Japanese Cultural and Community Center of Washington and the Wing Luke Museum. Thank you also to our 2021 series sponsor, the Tacoma Jewish Community Fund. The Holocaust Center's museum is open on Sundays, and you can reserve your tickets now to explore our exhibit, Finding Light in the Darkness, where you can hear from survivors and view artifacts that tell the personal stories behind the history. When you visit the Holocaust Center, we ask you to consider the land on which you are standing. The Holocaust Center for Humanity in downtown Seattle sits on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. The Holocaust Center's mission is to teach the lessons of the Holocaust to inspire students to confront indifference and racism in their own lives. One of the ways we do this is by helping to prepare teachers to bring this subject to their students. Our teacher workshops focus on pra practical strategies and provide teachers with tools to connect the lessons of the Holocaust to our world today. On June 29th, next week, Tuesday, we are offering a day of learning, five virtual sessions throughout the day. The programs are geared towards educators, but anyone is welcome to attend. And you can sign up for one or multiple. All of the programs are free and you can find the details on our website, holocaustcenterseattle.org. When you come to the Holocaust Center's museum, or when you attend one of our teacher workshops, you will hear the personal stories of those affected by the Holocaust. It's the personal stories behind the history that teach us the lessons. These stories stay with us long after the dates and the facts. They show us the effects of our collective actions and inactions, and they show us the people behind the laws and the decisions. Personal stories challenge our ability to dehumanize people who are different than us. This past weekend, we recognized, celebrated, and maybe even mourned our fathers. And it is in this context that I wanna share with you a short clip of Frank Fuji. Right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, the FBI picked up Frank Fuji's father and he was interned in a Department of Justice camp. After about three years, the Department of Justice released Frank's father and he was incarcerated with Frank and the rest of his family at Tule Lake. Frank was 12 when he was incarcerated and 15 when he was reunited with his father. In this short video clip, we will hear Frank describing what it was like when he finally saw his father again. So we're waiting for a truck to drop him off and we waited, waited. I remember it was in the afternoon and it was a hot day and the truck dropped him off and he had to get off the back and I grabbed his luggage and I brought it inside. And Now I didn't see him from 41 December 7 till 40, for something uh, in the 44. So that's a few years. And I think when I've grown up so much, I've, I've, my body changed, my looks changed, and I'm more a man. I mean, I've grown about five, six inches. And, but the bad scenario was, as he went around the room, he nodding his head and kind of greeting everybody by looking at them and kind of saying, I think I know you, but hi, how are you? But then he points to me, and of all people, and he says, who's this boy? And you know, that, that really shook me. But um, I, I never forgot that because uh, I felt lost at that time. And I think that uh, 
a mental part of it all. And that's what I think the effect of camp does to you. And, uh, mm. It is the other monetary kind of things that uh, get to you. It's the because you could always sort of adjust, but the the loss of uh, family tie and it was tough. It's my honor to have with us today Tom Ikeda, the founding executive director of Densho. Tom is a sensei, a third generation Japanese American who was born and raised in Seattle. Tom's parents and grandparents were incarcerated during World War II at Minidoka in Idaho. In addition to leading the organization Densho over the last 24 years, Tom has conducted more than 250 video recorded oral history interviews with Japanese Americans. Prior to working at Densho, Tom was a general manager at Microsoft in the Multimedia Publishing Group. Tom has received numerous awards for his, com for his community and historical contributions, including the Humanities Washington Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Public Humanities, the National JACL Japanese American of the Biennium Award, the Microsoft Alumni Integral Fellows Award, and many more. I've had the honor of working with Tom and Dan Cho for over 15 years. We share an understanding of the power of testimonies and the importance of connecting these lessons in history to our world today. Tom will take questions at the end of the program. Please type in your questions at any time into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And Tom, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much, Ilana, and you know, for the introduction. Um, and I, I just also want to acknowledge you. You mentioned working with you 15 years, and you mentioned a little bit about your teacher training, your education program. You know, as someone who has participated, I just want to let people know how how valuable and how you know how much I learned um, by coming to the Holocaust Center. So thank you, and and also thank you for starting the program with that um, clip of Frank Fuji. Um, you know, I I actually got a little emotional thinking about that. Um, yeah, that was an early clip that we did at Den Show. And, and I think that was the first clip when I saw um, we were at a, you know, kind of a, an early staff meeting where I, I actually broke down and cried. Um, you know, Frank was, you know, a teacher at Franklin High School and uh, was the art teacher and the uh, basketball coach. And uh, I knew Frank quite well. And, and, uh, and to see him share that way, I know was was really emotional for me. So again, thank you for sharing that clip. It really kind of got me into, you know, into the space of 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 sharing in terms of what, of you know, you know, the purpose we're here. Um, you know, the the topic, um, you know, anti Asian hate and the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. You know, one of the things I love about working with the Holocaust Center is, uh, you know, you'll approach me every once in a while and say, you know, talk about you know, a topic that maybe I haven't talked about as much. And, and so it made me think over the last few weeks, what I want to say. And, and I actually am, am going to frame the my talk um, a little differently. And, and so I'm kind of excited to see how this goes. Um, and so actually, let me no, actually, let me share another screen. Yeah, this one. Yeah, so I'm going to do a PowerPoint. And um, the way I'm going to frame this is around some of the key learnings and, and lessons um, that I've, you know, I've learned in the last 25 years uh, doing Den Show. And, and it kind of coincides with anti-Asian hate. And so let me start first with the first lesson. I'm going to do four lessons. And the first lesson is that, that xenophobia is very much part of the history of America. And, you know, the definition of xenophobia, it's a, it's a Greek word, um, xenos, uh, meaning the stranger or the other, and phobia, the fear of. And, you know, what we know from American history is, you know, the fear and hatred of others is very much part of, of the origins of our country from the genocide, and you talked about the, the land acknowledgement, but the genocide of indigenous people, um, our roots in slavery, 
um, our, our history of how we treat immigrants, especially immigrants of color as they, as they came into the United States. You know, in terms of anti-Asian hate, you know, I, you know I, I'm showing this photograph, an uh, early photograph from the 1800s uh, depicting Chinese um, immigrants and not just the, the kind of the racist looking face, but you know, this image of them you know, bringing so much you know, vice and, and harm you know, to America. And, and this was the imagery that Asians, uh, especially in the 1800, late 1800s, and early 1900s um, had to face. In fact, you know, for the um, Chinese, it led to the 1882 Exclusion Act. Uh, where it was the first case where, uh, in terms of immigration law, that the United States, you know, barred or excluded um, a group from coming into the United States. And you know, with that exclusion of of, of Chinese, uh, Japanese started coming uh, because you know the United States you know wanted a labor force, and so you had this this Japanese immigration starting in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and and then at that point. Um, Japanese were then depicted as even being more dangerous than the Chinese. And instead of immigration, uh, things like invasion were used uh, uh, in terminology in terms of what, uh, who the Japanese were. And so this was the, the tenor, the, the, the situation that my family uh, you know, came into uh, the United States. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about my family to make it more personal. You know, this is a photograph of my grandparents, you know, Suikichi and Akino Kinoshita. My grandfather came to Seattle in 1908. And, you know, I mentioned the 1882 Exclusion Act for Chinese. In 1908, uh, the United States signed a treaty with Japan to further halt immigration. In this case, it was to halt the, um, the immigration of all Japanese laborers. So if my grandfather had tried to come to Seattle just a few months later, uh, he would have been barred. He would not have been allowed. Uh, but he did make it into Seattle. Um, he ended up working at the Rainier Club as a bell captain. Um, and after about a dozen years in Seattle, he returned to Japan and married my grandmother, Akino. And then they returned to Seattle to start raising a family. Uh, so this was, this was my family story coming to Seattle. And here's a picture from the 1930s where my grandparents uh, show um, you know, their family of six. And my mother is the third from the left. And this was taken up uh, sort of on the, um, the north end of Capitol Hill uh, where, they, where they lived. And you know, it's a, a picture of a family that in the midst of a lot of discrimination, still thriving. Um, you know, my uh, older uncles and, and aunts were um, uh, well respected in school. Oftentimes, Japanese Americans were, you know, the leaders of their um, high schools, places like Broadway, Garfield. Um, for those of you in Seattle, you would recognize those names. But yet, there was this this tenor of anti Asian sentiment. And I mean, uh, show this with another clip. This is. Um, my father-in-law, Frank Yamasaki, who was born in Seattle in 1923. And Frank grew up in South Park, uh, grew up uh, where his best friends were Italian Americans. And uh, South Park, it was agriculture back then. You know, it, it's kind of by the um, you know, Boeing field. And oftentimes the produce that they raised would be sold at the Pike Place Market. And there the stalls were um, predominantly Italian and Japanese uh, before the war. And here's a story where Frank talks about on a hot day at the public market, um, you know, wanting to go swimming. And within a few blocks of the Pike Place Market was the uh, swimming pool, Crystal Pool. And here Frank talks about going to the pool with his Italian friends. Well, uh, the kids. Uh, I've had some uh, horrendous experience or shocking experience. I would forget that, uh, you know, there are moments that we forget that we are racially different. And there was a time where a um, uh, 20th parent had a, a stall at the public market and uh, uh, 
we would go there after uh, you know some activities and then uh, there was one day uh, Tony and Vito and the, the, another f fellow it, it was hot they said hey let's go swimming you know and uh, the pool is right up here at Crystal Pool you know and we looked at it you know we had it cost a dime so I said hey that's a great idea so here we go we it's only a couple of blocks from the market so we went there and uh, they paid and I was in line and when it came to me and it's they said no. They just they did say they just waved their hand and said out. And uh, it just caught me by surprise. And the the others they were shocked. They didn't know they couldn't understand it. I understood right away what it was about. And they they start arguing with them, uh, with the clerk there or the cashier and uh, at the same time, I was uh, already halfway down the block. Uh, yeah, that was. Can you tell me what was going through your head at it, the time? It's just, it's just shocked. It's just kind of a bitter, like, like being slapped, and you're in a state of shock. And yeah, so that uh, clip and and. Uh, um, Sorry, my, my computer is kind of making funny noises right now. But um, yeah, I want to mention that I, I sh I've shown that clip uh, previously at the Holocaust Center. Um, hang on one second. Let me see if uh, so. For some reason, my screen sharing was was doing that. But but um, I'll come back to my screen. But the um, you know I, I've shown that clip before at the Holocaust Center because Frank talked about. Um, going to the Crystal Pool. The current site of the Holocaust Center is the old Crystal Pool. And and I, I so appreciate when I go to the Holocaust Center to mention how, um, you know, where uh, before World War II, um, you know, that was a site of, you know, prejudice and, and where people of color could not actually enter and go into. It's now a place of education and healing. And so I think it's it's ironic, but yet, I think uh, it's wonderful that uh, that that site has been repurposed. Um, you know, going back to um, you know this concept of, of xenophobia, um, and hang on one second. For some reason, my I stop sharing and. Uh, restart the slideshow. So, um, you know, in the midst of, you know, the, the xenophobia, you know, you, we, we then had the, the, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and, and, you know, where over 3,500 servicemen were wounded or killed. FBI immediately began arresting uh, Japanese immigrants. And in, in, in the midst of this fear and confusion, uh, you know, this anti-Asian, anti-Japanese sentiment, you know, just, um, uh, just accelerated. I mean, it was, it was much, much larger, as you can imagine. You know, here is a cartoon from uh, Dr. Seuss. It was um, published in a New York uh, newspaper, um, a, you know, a, a, in, in, um, in January, actually uh, early February, uh, it was published. And, and here it depicts again, you know, sort of uh, Japanese in a racist way, but more more ominously, you know, showing them as potential, you know, spies, saboteurs. You know, this this term, you know, fifth column, is essentially synonymous to like a, a terrorist cell, where uh, you know Japanese. Uh, uh, Americans were essentially planted on the West Coast of the United States to wreak havoc uh, while they waited a signal from Japan to, to, um, um, you know, to start this devastation of places like Boeing Field or, or other places. So that was kind of the, the tenor of the times that, that, again, its roots are in this anti-Asian anti sentiment. Which, which brings me to lesson two. So we talked about xenophobia, but what you know, I learned and, and Japanese Americans who were um, um, 
uh, affected by World War II. Through civics, we all have learned that the U.S. Constitution and our courts, you know, are supposed to and have the power to protect the vulnerable against xenophobia. You know, that is, you know, one of the things that makes, uh, we believed, um, that makes America exceptional um, and why we are supposedly different and we're supposed to be this shining light. I mean, that very much was um, what we were brought to believe. And yet we know that it doesn't always work because, you know, going, you know, you know, to continue on with the story of Japanese Americans, uh, uh, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, uh, which led to the uh, mass removal and incarceration of Japanese Americans. And I just want to talk a little bit about that. So 110,000 individuals, two thirds of them U.S. citizens, so around 80,000 U.S. citizens in particular are, are removed from the West Coast um, they're first held in uh, what were called euphemistically assembly centers, but they were, you know, barbed wire detention facilities, uh, and then moved to 10 large inland concentration camps, which were called relocation centers. You know, um, all these individuals, um, legal residents and U.S. citizens, there were no trials or hearings as part of this executive order. Um, you know, I want to touch upon... Um, you know, the, my terminology, you know, I, I use the term concentration camps. And I use this as a historian because the term concentration camp was actually used during World War II, during this time period. Uh, you had people here like from uh, Congressman Ford of San, Santa Monica saying that, you know, all Japanese, whether citizens or not, should be placed in inland concentration camps. Uh, you had President Roosevelt at press uh, conferences using the term concentration camp in terms of where Japanese Americans were going. Even the Supreme Court used that terminology. And yet when I use the term concentration camp or American concentration camp, I am in no way trying to equate um, what happened uh, to Japanese Americans to the Nazi death camps. In, in many ways, I view concentration camp as a euphemism for the death camps that the Nazis um, uh, constructed and, and implemented. Um, and, and yet there's rhyming. And, and um, I think it's interesting um, for us to recognize, especially when we think of American uh, exceptionalism, that a lot of what happened to Japanese Americans, um, especially some of these early steps, rhymed with what was happening in Germany. And so here I have two columns. Um, there was a weekend in April 1942, uh, a Saturday, Sunday. And uh, here's information in terms of what was going on in, in Würzburg, Germany, where about 800 people were being boarded uh, to trains under armed guard, while the next day in Santa Monica, you had 800 people being boarded you know, under armed guard to buses. Um, in Germany, they were being forced from their homes because they were Jewish. In Santa Monica, they were being forced from their homes because they were of Japanese ancestry. And in both cases, they were only allowed to, to you know, uh, take with what they can carry. And, and at their destination, they were uh, uh, facing confinement um, under armed guard. Um, yeah, I just want to note, um, it was a side note, you know, this information was given to me by Professor uh, Eric Muller, a law professor from uh, University of North Carolina, uh, who is a top scholar in Japanese American history but also um, his family. Um, uh, he has family members who have survived the Holocaust as well as who perished during the Holocaust. And usually uh, before COVID would spend uh, a week or so in Germany uh, leading a class on Holocaust education. So very well versed on, on both. And I, and I mentioned Eric, and I wanna spend a little bit of time because last night I, I heard from um, uh, or heard about um, uh, Eric being targeted uh, for his political beliefs, that um, you know, Eric is a, a well-known, well-respected law professor uh, at uh, University of North Carolina. He's also the chair of the University of North Carolina Academic Press um, uh, for the last six years has chaired that, and it's known as one of the best academic presses in the country. And um, over the last few years, Eric has been outspoken about uh, you know, some Confederate statues on the campus of uh, University of North Carolina. And um, it appears that because of his political beliefs and his speaking out, 
that uh, he is being ousted as the chair of this academic press. And you know, I'll, after this presentation, I'll be reaching out to Eric to see how we can support him. I just wanted to mention, especially as I saw this slide and thought about where I got this information and, uh, um, and just want to mention that. Uh, you know, moving on, you know, here's a, a photograph coming again back to my parents. This was the, um, what was called the Puyallup Assembly Center. This is where my, my parents, my grandparents, uh, were all uh, taken from Seattle. Um, and as you can see in the sort of in the early summer of Seattle, it can be wet. And, um, and these were the conditions at the Puyallup um, Assembly Center, which euphem or not, yeah, euphemistically uh, was labeled and, and called Camp Harmony. Uh, this is what they called the place as they brought Japanese Americans uh, you know, to, the, uh, to the site. And, this, and, and from here, my, my parents went to the uh, Minidoka, Idaho concentration camp uh, where they spent about you know, three years. This next photo, um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about the history of the camps, but again, I want to you know, kind of reinforce lesson two that even though we have the constitution and the courts, it, it, it fails us. And I want to make it personal by showing this photograph of my grandparents. Um, you know, it was a dusty field um, at the uh, Minidoka camp. Uh, their eldest son, you know, my, my mother's brother, my uncle, was killed in action fighting for the uh, U.S. Army in Europe. Um, he was part of the 100th Battalion of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, a all uh, a segregated uh, Japanese American infantry unit that to this day is noted as one of the most highly decorated units in the uh, US history. And if you wanna learn more, there's a, a book that came out recently uh, uh, by Daniel James Brown called Facing the Mountain that talks about this more. But here, um, um, even though um, by you know, really all measures, uh, my family uh, would be viewed as loyal Americans, they were yet placed in this concentration camp and at the uh, death of their eldest son, the military didn't even send a, a military official to give them the flag. That the flag was presented by another Japanese immigrant um, to them. And, and those were the conditions. You know, those were um, the, um, uh, in some ways, the, I, I think of the disrespect they had, even though um, they were, uh, at this point, uh, my, parent, my grandparents were legal residents because they couldn't become U.S. citizens. They were barred from becoming U.S. citizens and, and their children were all U.S. citizens. Um, which, which kind of brings us to, to, to point three, lesson three, um, which was really important. And this concept of, of reconciliation. Um, so we had a situation where the constitution and our courts didn't protect um, Japanese Americans because of you know, fear and xenophobia and misinformation. And so what, what's needed? And you know, for the Japanese American community, reconciliation was very important. And in particular, when the US government fails to protect the vulnerable and commits an injustice. And I'm, I'm gonna do this again with a story. Um, this is a picture of Henry Miyatake. And again, this I think is, you know, for, for those of us who live in Seattle and, and grew up in Seattle, um, you know, Henry's talking about the early days of the supersonic transport program back in the 70s when, when it actually was stopped. Um, Boeing made a decision to stop it. And this was a time period um, for kind of old time Seattle lights, you know, when the billboards went up um, saying, you know, with the last person uh, left in Seattle, you know, turn the lights out because, you know, it was, it was a difficult time and a very difficult time for Boeing. They were laying out, uh, laying off a lot of people. H Henry was a, um, a brilliant um, Boeing engineer. Uh, he uh, had at least two patents that I'm aware of while he worked at Boeing and was viewed as one of their star engineers. Uh, even with that, um, uh, Boeing uh, treated him differently. And here um, Henry talks about how he was treated, but furthermore, which was really striking to Henry, 
how the manager used his Japanese American sort of heritage and the fact that the government did what they did to Japanese Americans during World War II as part of a part of the way he treated him. So here's here's a clip of Henry talking about this. Then he gets into this realm about uh, okay, um, since um, we can't give you an equivalent job, uh, one thing we we'll have to do is we're going to have to give you a pay cut. So they said, well, they they are chopping a quarter of my pay <laughs> in one joke. And he said, we're doing this to all the guys in the termination group, and you guys should be lucky that you're going to be offered a job. Um, <laughs> Then I kind of got kind of peeved at this whole process. And I said, you know, this is so arbitrary, you know. We, we're not even giving a fair shake. And uh, so <laughs> he gets out a bunch of papers off of his briefcase and <laughs> starts saying, hey, uh, I, I know uh, Japanese Americans. I have a neighbor that's a Japanese American. And, uh, He's a smart guy, but he's one of these guys that never say anything. <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell me about Japanese American history a little bit. At that point, um, he says, okay, this is the creed of the Japanese Americans. And he started reading it to me. They got the, the creed in an essence was his justification for saying, well, we can treat you any, any way you feel like. And uh, that was a very interesting message to me that stated, hey, um, this is the way that, that this guy is appraising me in terms of how I feel about uh, my treatment to the company. And it was like, um, like a big bell ringing, you know, saying, <laughs> hey, wake up, buddy, <laughs> you know. You don't, you're not as good as what you think you are. I mean, they're, they're gonna treat you just like what you deserve. <laughs> so that kind of really took me by surprise. And it also put me in a position of making me think maybe we we're gonna have to do something to have people reappraise their position for Japanese Americans. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I, I like that that um, that story, that Henry, because what you know, clearly what he recognized was, um, you know, the perception of Japanese Americans um, in terms of of others was affected by how they were treated by World War II, how they were portrayed in the media. But what Henry recognized was unless Japanese Americans took a stand, that this treatment would continue. And furthermore, Henry believed that it was, it was you know, Japanese Americans, um, it was their fault if they didn't. And so Henry took all his brilliance, his drive, and, and really started pushing for um, a reconciliation, a, a redress, um, a reparations um, uh, for the government to apologize. And this you know, helped lead this effort um, throughout the community um, uh, demanding that the government take a look at this. Um, it led to um, a US um, presidential commission um, where it was bipartisan, you know, Congress members were all involved. And this commission, their findings were that indeed um, the government covered up a lot of information. That although they argued that you know Japanese Americans had to be placed in camps and removed from the West Coast because of military necessity, that in fact the commission found that there was no military necessity, and that the real reasons, the real causes of incarceration, were race prejudice, war hysteria, and a failure of political leadership. And, and with that information. Um, Congress passed and President Reagan signed the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which provided uh, to Japanese Americans a presidential apolo apology and a $20,000 uh, um, restitution or reparations payment. And, and furthermore, it was a very visible event. You had uh, Ronald Reagan signing it, a lot of, of, of again, bipartisan 
And it was an important statement that the government made in terms of admitting the wrong and, and paying uh, reparations for it. And, and that helped Japanese Americans move on. Um, and it also helped uh, clarify to people that indeed the United States did a wrong and they're admitting it. And that, and that really was important, I think, in terms of, again, when our, our country fails, it needs to, to uh, remedy that. Which, which now leads to, to lesson four, um, and that we need to stand up for the principles of the Constitution. Um, but recognizing its failings at times or its weaknesses in terms of, of upholding the Constitution, we need to be the allies for the vulnerable. You know, the allies that Japanese Americans didn't have during World War II. And in many cases, you know, I, I, I frame the, the talk to get to this point because I so appreciate the Holocaust Center for inviting me to talk because that really truly is a, a form of allyship that we're working together to, to share these stories with different communities um, and to talk about these, uh, um, you know, what's happening in our country today. Um, you know, a, a couple years ago, or almost maybe three years ago, um, the, um, you know, the Trump administration implemented uh, what was commonly called the uh, Muslim travel ban. And what they did was they restricted travel from um, several predominantly Muslim countries. And this came with, you know, very explicit wording from the president about uh, his reasons why to do this, to really keep, uh, you know, Muslims, um, you know, out. And the first couple executive orders were actually quickly overturned uh, by the courts. And they finally worded the, the, the laws and the orders in a way that um, um, uh, essentially made the case that it was a military necessity to restrict uh, travel from these various countries. Um, and even though uh, almost all of them were predominantly Muslim, they even added another country that wasn't. And they used that to... to um, um, you know, to, to make their case. And uh, it went to the Supreme Court. Um, it was, uh, you know, the, um, what I, I think, uh, Trump versus Hawaii. Um, and, and there was, um, you know, we all wondered how the Supreme Court would rule. And they, they ruled um, in favor of the Trump administration, saying that, yeah, because of national security, um, the, the, the president can restrict uh, this, even though it, it, it appeared to be a thinly veiled um, um, policy against Muslims. But the Supreme Court ruled that. And so here I was on the courts of the um, uh, federal courthouse in Seattle, which ironically is the William Kenzo Nakamura federal courthouse. And, you know, connecting to my story, when I show that photograph of my grandparents accepting the American flag, it was a memorial service that um, memorialized seven Japanese Americans who were killed in action. Uh, in addition to my uncle, another uh, man that was honored uh, that day was William Kenzo Nakamura, uh, a Medal of Honor recipient um, who served um, in the same um, you know, regimental combat team as my uncle and, and this courthouse was named that. So I, I ironically noted that as I, as I gave the speech um, you know, again, talking about the Supreme Court Muslim ban and the reason why I was there, because um, it's interesting, Chief Justice Roberts, in his opinion, uh, stated that uh, Korematsu, which was the Japanese American case that challenged the uh, World War II um, exclusion and removal from the West Coast, you know, he clearly said Korematsu was wrong the day it was decided and has been overruled in the court of history and has no place in law under the constitution. You know, furthermore, you know, he said, you know, the forcible relocation of US citizens to concentration camps solely and explicitly on the basis of race is unlawful and outside the scope of presidential authority. So he, he stated that in his opinion, uh, but yet he failed to say that the Supreme Court in Korematsu ruled in favor of, at that point, the FDR administration, because the argument was it was a military necessity, not because of race, but it was really what has been you know, known now is a thinly veiled way of, 
of, of, of hiding the fact that um, it was a discriminatory you know, race based uh, um, sort of decision. And yet the chief justice sidestepped it by, by saying that, um, 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 that, you know, it was, um, you know, not, not because of they were predominantly Muslim, but because of national security reasons. And so that, um, you know, kind of, you know, ends, you know, my presentation and we'll go to Q and A, but I really want to frame kind of in the beginning, you know, the anti-Asian hatred is very much part of the history of our country, uh, this sense of xenophobia and, and we know that xenophobia and the treatment of others has been not just an American thing, it's been historically worldwide. And the United States was supposed to be the shining beacon uh, with our constitution and courts to protect against that. Uh, and what we have uh, seen hopefully in this presentation is how it can fail. Um, and then when it fails, the importance of, of reconciliation, which you know, for those of you who, have, who are listening to me probably you know, probably would understand why Densho and I am in support that we take a look at at the issue of reparations for slavery because it is something that was an injustice and and yeah maybe we have to talk about you know what you know what were the U.S. policies and how to do this but the key thing is you know having that discussion opening up for discussion and and to examine to see what remedies we can we can make. And then the fourth one, uh, which I, I really want to emphasize is, and this picture um, uh, depicts this, is the importance for us to stand up, to recognize that you know, our laws, our courts, our systems are, have failed and will fail. And, and to prevent that, uh, what I have seen that, that, uh, that can help is for us to, um, you know, to work together, to to be allies with each other, you know, we, we and we often say to be in solidarity, uh, because that does make a difference. And which again gets me back to why I so appreciate the Holocaust Center for inviting me to speak, because it is a form of solidarity that we are together. And I have so much respect, you know, for the Holocaust Center, their work, and um, I'm glad I can do this. And so with that, I will stop my screen share. You know, invite Ilana back. You know to uh, join me, and uh, and we could just kind of chat for a while. Thank you so so much, Tom. Thank you for all the personal stories and the great history. We have a number of questions um, from participants, so I'll pose a few of them to you. Um, the first one actually comes from Arthur, and he says. In what ways did interned adults secretly and at risk of punishment try to relieve suffering and help those less fortunate than themselves? Uh, so let me make sure I understand. So what ways did interned adults secretly and at risk of punishment try to relieve suffering? Um, and so, so, uh, uh, Ilana, what, what, what do you think the question, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I understand the question. Yeah, uh, I think the question is more like within the camps, how were people helping each other out or helping out others, even if it was maybe risky? Oh, okay. So, okay. That, that, that makes sense. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, instances of, um, you know, I, I think there's this perception that, during World War II and during the camp experience, you know, Japanese Americans uh, were very docile, went along and never broke the rules. And, and there actually was a, a strong um, um, a level of resistance um, of, of people standing up for their rights and, and being you know, pushed against um, 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 and pushing against you know, the government in terms of some of their policies and camps. Um, and, you know, uh, something else that I think people would find uh, really interesting. And, and this came out from a, a recent book. And I think Frank Abe, who uh, was one of, and uh, Tamiko Nimura wrote about this in a recent um, graphic novel called We Hereby Refuse, which looks at the resistance by Japanese Americans. And, and something that happened 
in the camps. And Seattle is actually a, a great example to talk about this. That picture of Camp Harmony that I, I showed um, of the Puyallup Assembly Center, the, the government, they called it an experiment, um, but there was a, a, a Japanese American group um, during World War II, um, they're still around, um, it was the Japanese American Citizens League. And at that point, the leadership of the JCL um, wanted to um, show the US government that they um, want to be a very, they, they felt the, the best um, path for the community was to really cooperate with the, the, the government. And, and in my opinion, they went uh, too far during World War II to the point where they started um, naming people, you know, turning names into the FBI and other officials in terms of, of potentially being um, um, you know, subversive, um, which as you can imagine could you know, cause a lot of dissension within the community. But furthermore, the government actually gave some JCL leaders uh, from Seattle the authority to actually help run the Puyallup Assembly Center. Um, and, and there were a lot of tension and, and there were people who resistance in, in terms of something that people did to um, go against and, pro and protect um, these people, they, they would hide them in camps. I mean, they would um, uh, do things like that. So that is an example of people um, doing things, um, you know, maybe against the law or whatever that could put them in, in more danger, uh, but they felt that was right. So that's, that's one example. And, and again, I, I want to plug a little bit. We hereby refuse graphic novel, great one. I did a book event, I think it was last week uh, with the Seattle Public Library here, uh, something to look at. Thank you. Yes, I definitely want to put in a plug for the book. It's excellent. Um, Tom, there's another question that came in, and this one came from John, and he says, why were there no protests or no people marching in the streets in California, or I would add elsewhere, when people's Japanese neighbors were being rounded up and sent away? Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, you know, when you look, it's I, and, and, you know, I, I get that question in schools, and 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 it, it you know kind of hits a nerve with me it's like yeah why why not and and you know the constitution was there the courts were there uh you know people clearly knew especially neighbors i mean you 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 had this experience and again you know thinking of the northwest you had a situation on bainbridge island where walt woodward the publisher of the um bainbridge island review uh and wrote an editorial and and here you had Japanese Americans on Bainbridge Island. And so Walt Woodward was a neighbor. He knew Japanese Americans and, and um, believed that they were um, good Americans. And so he actually was one of that rare case that actually uh, stood up. He wasn't protesting, but he did write an editorial saying, you know, what are we doing? We, we know these people and maybe there might be some, some um, subversive action with people we don't know, but we, we have to make sure that we don't mistreat the, the people we know. Um, so that was a isolated case of someone actually standing up and being an ally uh, with the community. But other than that, and some um, um, other instances of, you know, the American friends, you know, the, the Quakers um, actually stood up, but, but very different than what I would say happens today. There was not that, um, um, case where others would stand up for Japanese Americans. And, and it gets to sort of the, you know, the comment I made or that last lesson in terms of, you know, having been affected or having our community been affected so much by what happened and the fact that there weren't people there to uh, be in support. And also recognizing, you know, as a historian, how difficult it was when you are being targeted, you're vulnerable, you're under attack to really actually push back in many ways. You're, you're just trying to survive the experience. Um, you're, you're um, in many cases, trying to do things to make it as, as easy and best as possible for yourself and your family and your friends. And, and what that really taught me was, it really is incumbent on others who see this happening to, to take a stand and, 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 and be there and, and to speak up 
uh, for these vulnerable communities. And that's why you, know, you saw me on the courts uh, or on steps of the courthouse. Um, um, a couple of years ago, I was um, uh, at a place called Fort Sill, Oklahoma, you know, as um, uh, the US government was starting to create um, uh, new uh, you know, detainment centers, new kind of concentration camps for uh, at this um, incident at, uh, for children, you know, children who were being separated on the southern border. Uh, they were constructing a camp at a place called Fort Sill, Oklahoma, which um, historically was also a, a site where they held uh, you know, Japanese immigrants during World War II. So it was a former internment camp. And I had interviewed um, a man whose father was at Fort Sill during World War II, a Japanese American man from Hawaii, who was shot and killed at Fort Sill um, inhumanely. And with all that knowledge, <clears throat> I get emotional. Just think about it. You know, I could not sit back and just watch that. <clears throat> and, and I talk about it, you know, it was it was a <clears throat> it was kind of a defining point, you know, for me as an American. You know, as a historian, you know, an educator, sometimes you you look at things and you you try to look at things, you know, more objectively. But yet, you know, because of my knowledge of history, I know these things have happened and why they happened. And at some point, you realize you have to take a stand. And so I went down to Fort Sill, and um, and it was a <clears throat> you know form of nonviolent protest. You know, we were on uh, government land protesting, talking to the media. Uh, we were threatened by uh, the government, but we were all um, you're willing to be <clears throat> you know, in prison if that's what it would take. So, so a long answer in terms of you know the importance of this, but yet um, you know to the questioner's point, yeah, we didn't have those allies back during World War II. That's so powerful, Tom, and I think it hits on one of the main lessons that comes away from from all of these histories is that not enough people spoke out and this happened because not enough people spoke out. And if you study this history, then you, you know so deeply the responsibility that each of us holds in, in learning from that and doing something, which is just what you did. It's like, you can't, you can't just sit back and watch it happen. You have to go down there and do something if it's meaningful to you. Um, it's, I, I feel like it makes life harder, but you have to do it. You have to do it to be able to live with yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and we, and, and a lot of we, and we know this from history too, all of the, the horrible things that, you know, people have done to other people. And, and we talk about this, we say, you know, never again, we want to fight back. And, and what does that mean? And I think it, it is. I mean, this is our work to educate people and educate them not only in terms of how to spot this in terms of, you know, that was sort of my, the way I framed it in terms of these lessons, you know, xenophobia, we, yet we have protections, they fail. Uh, how do we stop it? You know, allyship. And it's, it's really um, also educating and, and, and letting people know that I think especially as, as in our country in terms of of how we're set up, we have to speak out, we have to take action. We can't just passively think, oh, we have people in place, the laws, and it's all gonna work out because we know it, it doesn't work that way. So thank right. you for, for, yeah, for reinforcing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think ultimately that that's what so many of these stories and this, these lessons boil down to. And one of the, one of the key takeaways from this is how important it is for us not to just sit back and wait for somebody else to step up. Um, that that we have to we have to do something because these histories happened because so many people sat back and watched it happen. Yeah, and again, um, so that's why I I I, I so I so love working with with you in the Holocaust Center because 
you know, we, we get this, we, we can, we not only talk about this amongst ourselves, but, you know, we support each other in, in events like this. And, mm-hmm. and so, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, just a, a plug to all the people listening, you should support the Holocaust Center. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's important because we, and, and I, I think people get a sense of, you know, the commitment and passion we have for this work. And it's really hard but it takes resources. I mean, it takes, you know, you, we should be able to make a living wage so that we can do this work because it not only because we're passionate about this, but it makes, it makes our world better. And, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's hard work. And, and as we know, the last five years in particular, I think have been really, really hard for, for a lot, a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, um, maybe harder than many years I remember for sure. Yeah, our, our world in so many ways was kind of turned upside down. Mm-hmm. Um, Tom, I'm wondering in just our last couple minutes, would you tell us a little bit about Densho and some of the great work you're doing there and what's coming up for you all? Um, certainly, I mean, you know, the, you know, the mission of Densho is to preserve and share the history of the, you know, the World War II Japanese American incarceration. And, and not just preserve and share the history, but to do it to promote equity and justice today. And, and so this talk I, I, I gave today is very much just total alignment with who we are as an organization. You know, the way we do this is, um, and you got an inkling a little bit in terms of seeing a couple of, of these oral history clips. I mean, you know, we've, um, you know, have collected and preserved over like a thousand in-depth oral histories. Uh, we have over a hundred thousand historical photographs and documents. Um, we have, you know, what we call contextual pieces in terms of educational curriculum, online encyclopedias, and so we've taken this idea of a museum or interpretive center, and and sort of um, created it online, so it's all virtual. And I think you know, we are known, you know, you know, sort of nationally as really stretching the limits of what. Uh, can be done with this this content. You know, Alana mentioned earlier my my a uh, little bit of my background um, with technology. I was a you know general manager, uh, creating you know back then the multimedia CD-ROM titles at Microsoft about oh, 30, 35 years ago, and that's uh, you know a lot of that thinking and technology has sort of transferred to you know how we can collect and make these materials available to. To people all around the world, so that we can learn and and grow from from all that. Well, the work you're doing is just outstanding, and has always been a model for so much of what we're doing at the Holocaust Center too. So, you know, we appreciate you and your incredible staff for consulting with us on archives and testimonies. You've always been a great friend, and Tom, we so so appreciate you for coming and being a part of this program today. No, thank you, thank you, Alana, and and uh, and always. I mean, we. I mean, I, it's it's just. I just so appreciate the center and working with you. So again, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Tom. And I want to thank everybody who joined us for today's program. The program was recorded, so you can find it on our website starting tomorrow. Um, I hope those of you who are attending will consider becoming a member of the Holocaust Center for Humanity. By becoming a member, you help the Holocaust Center teach the lessons of the Holocaust, inspiring students of all ages to confront bigotry and intolerance. Members receive free unlimited admission and the satisfaction of helping to sustain this important work and memberships start at just $36 a year. You can find information on our website and become a member through a, a very simple process. I wanna give a special thank you to Richard Green, our museum and technology director who is running the technical side of the show. And also a huge thank you to our executive director, Dee Simon, and to our entire team, Lori Werschel Cohen, Nicole Bella, Julia Thompson, Paul Regelbrug, Ellie Selesky, Amanda Davis, Rick Brewer, Katie Lawrence, and Morgan Romero. Please join us next week at the same time for the fourth presentation in this four part series sponsored by Verizon called How to Use the Master's Tools or Not with Kendall Pinckney. 
Among the many critical social issues that have filled the headlines over the past years, the push for financial reparations to address the enduring legacy of American slavery among some activists has become a hot button topic that has garnered much debate. While it is impossible to settle such a complex matter, what ideas might Jewish text offer us in our wrestling with such complex issues? More details can be found on our website. We look forward to seeing you back here next week, Tuesday, same time at noon. Thank you so much. And this concludes our program for today.